Buenos dias, amigos. I've decided to read some more today because I don't want to go outside. It's all that snow out there and everything. So I want to sit here and read to you guys. So I got a few what I think are good stories. I got one right here. It's called Roger the jo Jolly Pirate. And it's by Brett Heliquist. And I think he does his own artwork as well. So here we go. Roger the Jolly Pirate. Before anyone had heard of, a, of Blackbeard, Long John Silver, or Calico Jack, there was a pirate named Roger. Hmm. Roger was a lousy pirate. He couldn't tell the starboard from the larboard, the windward from the leeward, or the mizzen from the main. He smiled instead of scowling, and he grinned instead of growling. He always had a yard to tell or a sea shanty to, to sing, and he had never struck fear in any sailor's heart. His shipmates called him Jolly Roger, but they didn't mean it nicely. When there was serious pirating to be done, the other pirates never wanted Jolly Roger around. If they planned to board an enemy vessel, make a prisoner walk the plank, or bury stolen treasure, they always sent Jolly Roger down, down to the ship's hold. This didn't make Roger feel jolly. The pirates on the Jolly Roger ship were the terror of the high seas. Merchant ships fled at the sight of them. Sailors surrendered without a fight. There was only one enemy worthy of their scowls. He was known as the Admiral. The Admiral had vowed to bring every pirate to justice. And at last the day came when he and his sailors attacked Roger's ship. Jolly Roger, of course, was sent below. Up above, the battle began. Below, Jolly Roger sat wishing he could think of something, anything, that would make the other pirates like him. And then he had a wonderful idea. He would bake a cake. In the hole, Jolly Roger spotted something that looked like a big iron pot. He happily dumped everything he could find into the pot, and he gave it a good steer. On deck, the cannons boomed and blazed. The pirates bravely fought the admiral's men from port to starboard, from stem to stern. But the pirates, they were outnumbered. As the pirate captain watched the admiral stride across the deck with his sword held high, he could see that all was lost. He prepared to surrender. And in the dim light of the hold, Jolly Roger found a wick attached to the pot that he had chosen, struck a match, and sat back to wait for his cake to bake. He didn't expect what happened next. Nobody did. Ho! Oh. Kaboom! Oh no! Jolly Roger was blown straight through the deck and right into the middle of the battle. He was covered in flour, he was spotted with soot, and he was shrieking in terror! The Admiral's men had never seen anything like it. A ghost yelped one, a skeleton screamed another, and the admiral himself gave the order, Abandon ship! Jolly Roger was, was sorry about his cake. He tried to explain, but no one would listen. They were too busy cheering.
Jolly Roger still couldn't tell the starboard from the larboard, the windward from the leeward, or the mizzen from the main, but his shipmates, they didn't care. In fact, they made a special flag in his honor. Soon, other pirates began flying the flag. It, was, it struck fear in the hearts of sailors across the seven seas. They called it the Jolly Roger. So now you know how that flag got to be it's what it's called. Anyway, here's another one. Now this book is from England, so you'll hear a couple of odd terms in it that, you know, what we, we call something, they call it something else. But this is by a uh, simp, it's called Simp, by John Birmingham. I really like the story here. This is a pretty good story. I think. So here we go. It's called Cannonball Simp. Again, by John Birmingham. Simp was what most people would call an ugly little dog. She was fat and small and only had a stump for a tail. Her owner had found homes for her brothers and sisters, but could not persuade anybody to take Simp. So, in order to get rid of her, he decided to leave her somewhere, hoping that somebody would find her and take her in. Personally, I think that's a cute little dog. One evening, he took Simp outside the town and just dumped her near a rubbish pit. Oh. Could you imagine doing that to a dog? Hmm. Poor little Simp watched as the van disappeared into the distance. She did not know what to do. The darkness fell. By the light of the moon, she explored the dump as she found an old armchair to spend the night in. Rats came out and looked curiously at her. And when Simp said how hungry she was, one of them gave her a piece of bread. But you have to go in the morning, he said. It's hard enough for us rats to live. There wouldn't be enough food for you as, as well as us. Simp. Oh, oh, oh. I think I just knocked my camera down here. Hang on a second, guys. I got to readjust it. I'll put my finger right over the limbs. There we go. I think that's okay. When it was light the next morning, Simp left the rubbish pit and wandered off in the direction of the town. She tried to make friends with people who were going to work, but nobody seemed to care about her. She spent a long time searching for something to eat. But she could not find anything. Then she came across dustbins. <clears throat> That's what I mean, the term dustbin. We would call them a garbage can. She started looking through them for food and did not notice the cats who were angrily watching her. Hey, that's my dustbin, hissed one of the cats as he pounced. Simp ran for her life with the cat just behind her. She was running so fast, she did not look where she was going. Oh, boy. Got ya, said the dog catcher. Two large hands grabbed Simp, and she was put in the back of the van with the other strays that the dog catcher had collected. Almost all the other dogs in the van had homes. We, we often get picked up, they said. But what will become of you with no home to go to? And you don't even have a collar. Silk became more and more worried as she talked to the other dogs. Well, who can tell you? Who can tell what may happen to you now? Said one said. You know, you're not very pretty, are you? said another. Why, I doubt if anybody will want to give you a home, said a third. The van pulled into the yard of the dog pound. The doors were opened and the dogs driven towards the kennels. And when the dog catcher was looking the other way, Sip saw her chance. She jumped up on some boxes and was, was ran away over the wall. Sip kept running and running until she was well out of town. And then, because she was still frightened, she crept into some thick bushes to hide. 
By the time it was dark, she had become very hungry and set off again down the road. Then, in the distance, Sip saw lights. They were the lights of a circus. She went towards them, hoping she might find someone there who would give her some food. Perhaps after that, she could curl up under a caravan where it would be a little warmer. Now, we would call that an RV trailer. They call it a caravan over in England. Hold that like that. She crept up to a trailer, climbed on a box, and looked through the window. Inside was a clown who was very surprised to see a little dog peering at him. He opened the door and beckoned to Simp. Oh, you look very tired and hungry, said the clown, and he gave Simp a large meal, which she gobbled right up. It was warm and comfortable in the caravan, and the clown let Simp lie on his bed. She was soon fast asleep. The next morning, the clown showed Simp around the circus. There were many tents and caravans and animals. Simp met a young elephant and a lion. Everybody seemed happy and friendly, but the clown was worried. The people did not like his act anymore. The clown told Simp exactly what he did. He showed her the cannon and that fired a rubber ball through a paper hoop. Just then the ringmaster came up. Hey! Unless you can improve your act by tonight, you'll have to go, he said to the clown. Simp had an idea. That rubber ball is exactly the same size as me. When I'm curled up, she thought, I just have time to work out a plan before the show starts. <clears throat> the evening performance had just begun. Just before the clown's act, Simp climbed into the cannon while nobody was looking. The man who was to fire the cannon peered inside, and seeing Simp curled up, thought she was the ball. Simp's heart was beating fast as she waited for the exciting moment to arrive. The circus managers had a look of boredom on their faces as they watched the clown. Eh, he'll really have to go, they said. Ooh. There was a rolling of drums and... Kaboom! Whoosh! Through the air flew Simp straight for the paper hoop. Right through the hoop she went. The crowds roared with delight when they saw that the cannonball was a little black dog. The clown was so surprised to see Simp that he almost dropped the hoop. Simp landed on a drum and stood there proudly while the audience cheered and cheered. Oh, she had really enjoyed being fired from the cannon. And then the clown and Simp were put on a horse, and they went around and around the ring. Everybody was still wildly clapping and cheering. After the show, the ringmaster gave a party for Simp and the clown. He invited the little elephant, the lion, and the monkey. Simp had met, Simp had met, and they all ate until they were quite full. The ringmaster told the clown and Simp that their act was the best act the circus had ever had. And somehow my, my camera keeps falling over on me there. There we go. And so Simp lived happily with the clown and traveled around the countryside with the circus. The act became famous and people came especially to see the little dog fired from the cannon. And that is how she came to be called Cannonball Simp. Okay, I got another story here. Let me readjust this camera. I don't know why it's moving around on me. 
This is called Those Darn Squirrels. It is by Adam Rubin and illustrated by Daniel Solmari. Those darn squirrels. In fact, I got a whole set of these stories. Eventually, I'll, I'll read more of them. We'll see how you guys like these. On the outskirts of town at the edge of the forest, there was a little old house. The only thing older than the little house was the man who lived in it. Old man Fuquire. Old man Fuquire was so old that when he sneezed, dust came out. He was also a grump, and he hated pie, and he hated puppies. Oh, the only thing he liked was birds. And all summer long, the old man painted pictures of birds that visited his backyard. There were whirly birds and, and bonga birds and baba birds and yaba birds. Even a rare flugel bird came by once or twice. Fulkwire's paintings, uh, they weren't very good, but the birds, they never said anything. When the air turned crisp and the leaves began to change color, the old man grew sad. He knew that soon the birds would fly south for the winter, as they did every year, and that he would be lonely. Then he had an idea. If he fed the birds, maybe they would stick around. So old man Fuquire built beautiful bird feeders, and he put them up all around his backyard. He filled the feeders with delicious seeds and berries, and soon birds came from all over the forest just to eat in the old man's yard. But the birds weren't the only ones who liked the bird feeders. Oh, the squirrels did too. Not many people know this, but squirrels are the cleverest of all the woodland creatures. In fact, they're fuzzy little geniuses. They can make a house out of a tree, a bed out of a bunch of leaves, and a box kite out of twigs, dirt, and squirrel spit. They are also excellent at math. Winter was fast approaching, and the squirrels needed to gather as much food as they could get ready. So they decided to take some of the bird food. The birds were not happy. Neither was old man Fuquire, and when he discovered what had happened, he shook his old man fist and yelled, Those darn squirrels! He filled up the feeders again, but this time he hung them from a clothesline. Then he went back inside, confident that the squirrels would no longer be able to get to the seeds and berries. But the squirrels were determined. They devised a plan, and this time they took all the food from the bird feeders. <laughs> the birds were Furious, hurrumph, 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 yelled the bonga bird. Those darn squirrels, yelled old man Fuquire. Yum, said the squirrels. <laughs> now, it was old man Fuquire's uh, turn to devise a plan. He went to the general store to get supplies. He bought lasers and clamps. He bought wires and springs. He bought all sorts of tools, and he built a veritable fortress around his bird feeders. Then he refilled them very carefully. Na 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 na, snorted, snorted the flugel bird. Oh, look what he's done. page. There we go. The squirrels stayed up all night working out their strategy. They drank cherry cola. They ate salt and vinegar chips to help them stay awake. Finally, they had it. The perfect plan. They put on their tidy helmets and prepared to launch themselves into the air, over the fence, between the lasers, and onto the bird feeders. 
That's quite a plan they've laid out there. The first squirrel misfired and hit a tree. Wham! And the second squirrel went too high and he landed in a bucket. Kabloosh! And the third squirrel sailed clear over the house. Oh. The birds laughed and laughed. They each had one last delicious mouthful of seeds and berries from the old man's feeder. Then they flew south for the winter, just as they did every year. <laughs> said the flugel bird. After the birds left, old man Fuquay was lonely just as he was every year. He mixed himself some cottage cheese and pepper, his favorite snack. But he was still lonely when, and when he looked out the windows, the squirrels could tell that he wasn't happy. Go away, shouted the old man. I don't like you squirrels. The squirrels held a meeting deep inside a large tree. They decided to give the old man a present to make up for taking the seeds and berries. Oh, I like that. Squirrel meeting tonight. <laughs> now, not many people know this, but squirrels are not only fuzzy little geniuses, they, are all, they also collect just about anything they find on the ground. The squirrels had a vast stockpile of spectacular junk to choose from. But what would Fuquayer like? Bottle caps? Hmm. Popsicle sticks? Hmm. Postage stamps? Finally they had it. The perfect gift. Look at all that junk that they've collected. Whoa. The squirrels stacked all of their loose change on old man Fuquire's doorstep. There were dimes and pennies. There were nickels and quarters. There were even a few tokens from, the, from Coco's Arcade. It all added up to $47.36, plus a few rounds of skee-ball. Maybe you squirrels aren't so bad, Fuquayer said when he found the coins, but I still like birds better. This gave the squirrels another idea. They raided their junk collection again, and they got to work. When old man Fuquayer woke the next morning, he was amazed to see that the birds had returned. But wait, those things weren't birds. They were squirrels in disguise. Great googly moogly, said old man Fuquire. This will make quite a painting. So he ran outside. He took down the lasers and the wires and the spring-loaded trapeze. He turned all the bird feeders into squirrel feeders. And then he painted till his brush ran out of bristles. Hope you can see all them squirrels. Oh, no. <laughs> the squirrels were so overjoyed they had a party in old man Fuquayer's house. Those darn squirrels, said Fuquayer, and he shook his old man fist. And he smiled. Oh, I think he's starting to like them. All right. And I got another one here. It's called, uh, let's see, You Don't Want a Unicorn. And this is by, um, let me see, Amy, Amy Dykeman, and it's illustrated by Liz Klimo. And uh, this, I, I just like this book, You Don't Want a Unicorn. So here we go. You Don't Want a Unicorn. Wait! You were going to wish for a unicorn, weren't you? Wishing for a unicorn is a big mistake. Just step away and plip. Uh-oh. Things are about to get... Poof! Ugly! Trust me. Sure, having a unicorn seems fun at first. All right, super fun. Yeah, well, fine, it's awesome. Okay. Hmm. 
but it's not worth it. When you do, what you don't know is unicorns shed. Oh, ooh. And they scratch. And no matter how hard you try, unicorns can't be house trained. You don't want to eat that, trust me. Don't even get me started on the jumping. Oh, and the chewing and the burping. Brap. Hey, not bad. You probably could pull this off. Huh. If it wasn't for the biggest top secret nobody knows about it problem with having a unicorn. Unicorns live in groups, and when a unicorn gets lonely, it calls a friend. Ding, ding, ding. Poof. No, right, right when you're thinking this could be double super fun. Poof, there's another. Poof, and another. And poof, and another. Great, you've unleashed the most destructive force in the universe. A unicorn party. Oh. I told you, why didn't you trust me? Quick, grab your piggy bank. Run! You have to wish them away. Yeah, that one needs to go back too. It's for the best, trust me. Blip. Poof. Aw, oh, cheer up. You could get a goldfish or a nice rock or... Look at he's looking at on that bench right there. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's what it says too. Uh-oh, stop! You don't want one of those either. Trust. Plink. Poof, me. Oh no. Now he's got a dragon. Yikes. Anyway, that's the end of that story. I hope you liked it. I, I thought it was kind of a cool story. You really don't want a unicorn. Ah, but for my last one here, this is called Count the Monkeys. Count the Monkeys by Matt Barnett and the illustrator Kevin Cornell. Matt Barnett and Kevin Cornell. All right, let's get started. Hey kids, time to count the monkeys. It's fun, it's easy. All you have to do is turn the page and count.